This last section on the biology of AIDS is about diagnosing and treating HIV and AIDS. And we will cover a little bit about how to diagnose it, and then also about the current drugs, what they target, and why it's so difficult to develop drugs as well as vaccines, which we'll have a short discussion about. And then um, I will finish with a little bit about the future of drug treatment and vaccine development. So the learning objectives for this section are for you to be able to name some common laboratory tests and also some rapid tests for HIV. Also that you could dis discuss efforts and requirements um, of promoting HIV testing and why HIV testing is so important. Then we'll spend a little time and hopefully you can um, correlate the HIV drugs with the different steps you learned about in the HIV life cycle. And then finally, um, that you would be able to discuss efforts for future drug development and vaccine development. So first of all, a little bit about diagnosing the, an HIV infection. So the hope is that we would diagnose it long before you get any symptoms. And so that requires laboratory tests because you will have no clinical symptoms in the beginning. So this so-called gold standard laboratory tests, which probably don't mean a lot, but are called EIA and Western blot. EIA stands, stands for enzyme immunoassay and Western blot is another one. And these are fairly complex tests that are performed in clinical laboratories. However, there are a number of what we call rapid HIV tests that do not require a lot of laboratory skill. And they can be done actually as in-home tests or uh, they can, the sampling can occur at home and they can be sent into a lab. And these rapid tests are, are very, very important, particularly in countries where there is not a lot of health care available and there may not be laboratories that have the more sophisticated laboratory testing. And I'd like to, you to take a few minutes and look at the YouTube that, um, that showcases President Obama recommending that everyone get tested for HIV. And he does this by showing that he and his wife both get tested for HIV because even people in a monogamous relationship are um, encouraged to do this. So a little bit about the rapid HIV tests. And they are much like if you've ever seen a pregnancy test. They are, are quick, they have simple directions, and if you look at the slide of the rapid test, you'll see that it basically entails reading a control to see that the test is working properly and then to see if there's HIV present or not. However, this, this sounds quite simple, but so much more goes into HIV testing. And as you already know, the reason I'm sure is that it involves the way we, most people get HIV. And most people get HIV AIDS through sexual contact. And this is part of the reason why we have so much difficulty getting people to get tested, as well as what to do then when the person finds out the results if they're positive, and that involves um, having counseling for those people. So even though s sexual contact, sexual intercourse, is actually a very inefficient way of transmitting HIV, after all, you have to transmit those infected immune cells to your partner to give them HIV, the, the infectivity is quite low because so much sexual activity does occur, um, this has become the primary way that people get HIV. Getting 
blood from someone that has HIV is a much more efficient way of transmitting the virus. But currently, very few people get it this way, mainly because we now have testing for our blood sources, and it's very seldom transmitted via a blood supply. So um, we look to the rapid HIV tests as to the means of diagnosing HIV infection, both in, in this country and certainly in countries where there is less available testing. So if you are interested in testing, and some of the, the details about it, you could take a look at the CDC website listed on your slide that goes into a great deal of uh, detail about both laboratory and rapid testing. Now, the World Health Organization, the WHO, has defined five key components in connection with HIV testing and they call these the five C's. And they must be respected and adhered to when there is HIV testing. This is obviously very different from testing for many other diseases or conditions. So first is consent. Um, the person getting tested has to obviously give their consent. Confidentiality mainly because of the way that HIV is transmitted, confidentiality becomes very important. And originally when, when HIV was first described and discovered, I actually worked in the laboratory at the time and we would label blood um, tubes from patients with HIV infection as HIV infection, but that no longer is permitted um, there to be um, treated in a confidential manner. Counseling is important because if a person finds out they have HIV, it is very important um, to counsel them about treatment because the earlier that treatment starts, the more likely they are to have a um, full lifespan. And also is important in regards to contacting any possible sexual partners. Of course, we want the correct test results, so normally, even when there's a positive with a rapid HIV test, um, they are usually done in a clinical lab, this one of the gold standard tests, to ascertain that indeed it was a positive result. And then, the, optimally, the patient should be connected with um, ways to treat to, and to prevent further, um, further passing on of this virus to other partners. So we do have actually a number of drugs, and I'm um, going to talk a little bit about how they work. And this slide lists the drugs by their mechanism of action. We're not going to go into the various brand names and, and so forth of the different anti-HIV drugs. But um, let me first say that that has improved greatly over the years. And what used to involve the patient taking many, many pills every day, now we have multi-class combination drugs that incorporate all of these various types of drugs I'm going to talk about into one pill, one dose per day. So it becomes much more convenient. So what are these drugs and, and how do they work? Um, they are really described according to what they do in their life cycle. So we have drugs that inhibit that reverse transcriptase enzyme. We have drugs that inhibit protease, which I haven't talked about yet, but I will momentarily. And then we have drugs that inhibit both entry and fusion. So if you look at your slide, you'll see that drugs that have been developed as entry inhibitors um, antagonize that co-receptor CCR5. 
So in other words, they get in the way such that the HIV is not able to um, properly enter or attach to those um, protein via their proteins to the CCR5 co-receptor. Then number of drugs are targeted towards preventing or inhibiting fusion of the HIV to the host lipid membrane. And even if an HIV attaches via its CD4 and CCR5, if we can prevent the lipid membrane of the virus fusing from the lipid membrane of the host cell, we can then prevent the virus from getting into or releasing its contents into the host cell. Then we have an, a number of what we call reverse transcriptase inhibitors. And if you recall, reverse transcriptase is very important to rewrite that RNA um, genetic material into DNA so that the organism can replicate. So if it cannot uh, rewrite the RNA as DNA, then it cannot replicate. So we have a number of different groups of these reverse transcriptase inhibitors known as nucleoside and non-nucleoside inhibitors. And then finally, we have a group of drugs called protease inhibitors. And I haven't mentioned this enzyme yet, but proteases are, are literally it means something that, that breaks down a protein. And what the HIV virus use their protease for is that when the proteins are initially synthesized in the host cell via the genetic direction of the HIV, they're actually um, synthesized as rather large molecules and the protease then sort of cuts them or chops them up into the protein size needed by the HIV. So some of the drugs will prevent this protease enzyme from working. So we have these, these nice drugs, seemingly. And so why is it so difficult to treat the HIV virus to kill it? Um, and I'll talk a little bit about why we're having some difficulty also developing a vaccine. So first of all, the HIV virus spends very little time outside of a cell. When it buds off of the first host cell, it quickly enters a, a second cell. And because you're making a lot of new cells in response to this infection, there are always a lot of cells, at least in the beginning, for the HIV to enter. So optimally, the drug has to get into your cell in order to work. Also, um, the, the drug is, is targeting a lot of the host cell activities because the virus takes over the function of your cell. Um, in essence, you are, with a drug targeted at HIV, you're also targeting the person's own cells. A big problem with our drugs is the development of resistance. So because HIV replicates so quickly, um, it also has a tendency to mutate. And anything that, that replicates quickly has a high mutation rate. And so as the organism is replicated, inevitably a mistake will happen that is a mutation. And this mistake may just be one that facilitates that virus to resist the drug. And so the one that survives then will go on to replicate itself. And before you know it, you have a, um, an infection that is resistant to the drug that was working up to that point. Also, because the virus spends little time outside of um, the cell, um, our other immune responses are not always that effective against it. And so antibodies have a hard time get 
reaching and, and interacting with the HIV virus. And because then the development of vaccines, often a big part of a vaccine is to get uh, your antibody response against the infectious agent. So even if we develop a very good antibody response, they're not always, they're not always effective, the antibodies. Um, the other thing is that if you induce that cytotoxic response, if you recall, that's produced by your CD8 T lymphs. Um, those are actually harmful to your CD4 T cells, so it's maintaining a very delicate balance there. So these and actually many other reasons are why we're having a really hard time treating and certainly we have not been able to, to cure the virus yet. But there is a great deal of research going on um, in regards to this. There um, are drugs being developed to target that CCR5 um, co-receptor. Is another um, means of treating this that has, in some cases, been actually curative, and that's a stem cell transplant. And what that is is getting the host, not the host, but the um, immune cells from someone else. So you get those stem cells that lead to the production of immune cells from a donor, and. However, this is only optimum if it's generally one of the, the few donors that has an innate resistance to HIV um, infection. And this is a little bit beyond the scope of this particular lecture on the biology of HIV. But if you're interested, um, there's some very, very um, interesting research in regards to this. Currently, there are many attempts at developing a vaccine because this would be optimum if we can prevent infection to begin with. And there's currently a vaccine known as RV144, and it's been in trial, it's been in clinical trials, and it has been somewhat effective. Um, there's been, after a year, about a 60% efficacy, but that falls off to about 30% after less than two years. So it's certainly not something that is going to absolutely prevent HIV infection, and there's more work to be done on it. There are going to be some follow-up trials starting next year, and um, what they attempt to do is take various proteins that the HIV has. Um, and if you look back in that original, that original picture, some of the names of them were the GAG, the GAG protein, and so forth. And um, when you vaccinate the person, you actually give them these proteins and hope that they develop an immune response against them. And therefore, then, if they encounter the virus, their immune response will destroy it. Um, there are currently a lot of efforts done by the P5 group. Um, a lot of research is done, and P5 stands for Pox Protein Public-Private Partnership. <laughs> and um, this is a partnership um, between the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, um, the NIH, and the Gates Foundation, in which, which is sponsoring a lot of research in the area of HIV prevention. And that uh, concludes this section on the biology of AIDS.